All right, so this week we're going to talk about pulmonary problems. So let's get right to it with one of my small pet peeves. You know I have a lot of pet peeves, right? Well, the thing that um, I've noticed nurses and students alike doing in the critical care setting or in any acute care setting is uh, being a little lazy when we're listening to lungs. Now, I put this up here so that you can see where the lower lobes are, um, are found in the chest exam. And notice that when you're looking at the anterior chest, you hardly see any of the lower lobes. Well, the lower lobes is where all the good stuff is, right? And by good stuff, I mean bad stuff. Crackles, um, ronchi, uh, all the stuff that you're going to hear is going to go to a dependent position, right? And when the patient is sitting in a chair or uh, on bed rest, it's in the lower lobes. That's where all the good stuff, that is bad stuff, resides. So when you're listening to lung fields and assessing lungs, you have to listen to the patient's back. That means sitting the patient up in bed or rolling the patient over so that you can hear the posterior lung fields. Now let's start with a little review of the uh, ventilation perfusion um, relationship. And remember that the alveolar unit includes the alveolus. That's the part of the lung that uh, gas moves through and the vasculature that surround the alveoli. And those vas those vessels then are the things that take the blood to the alveolar unit and uh, exchange gas there uh, in the blood and then take the blood back to uh, the left heart. So there's a few things that can go wrong. And I like this uh, uh, image because if you take it apart, it really makes a lot of sense. Uh, what are the things that can happen? So remember, there's a shunt unit where there's no ventilation that happens because of some problem with the um, alveolar unit. So in A here, we can see the, um, the shunt unit where no gas is getting to the uh, alveolar unit. And therefore, there's no gas exchange happening. And that causes a VQ mismatch, V standing for ventilation, Q standing for flow, or uh, in this case, perfusion. Okay. So in B, there's a VQ mismatch where there's partially compromised uh, airflow. And that's because of secretions that are in the uh, airways themselves, not as much in the alveolus, uh, but in the airways leading to the alveolus. And that causes a relative amount of mismatch. So there is gas exchange happening, but not at, uh, not at the right amounts. In C then, this is a normal functioning alveolar unit where there's good airflow through and the uh, gas exchange happens at the capillary level and everybody lives happily ever after. When we move to D, we can see the effects of a clot that are there. And if a clot forms, there's no blood that can get to the uh, alveolar unit and therefore no gas exchange happens. And then finally in E is what we call a dead space where there's, um, there's damage to the alveolar, I'm sorry, to the capillary system uh, at that alveolar unit. And that means that no gas exchange can happen there. And that's because of infarction usually uh, of lung tissue. All right. So those are the different ventilation perfusion uh, relationships. A has a low ventilation to perfusion ratio because there's no ventilation happening, but the flow is normal. And then E has a high VQ relationship where the ventilation is normal, but there's uh, no gas exchange because there's no flow to that alveolar unit. So I'm going to skip the questions, but uh, next, we're going to talk about the spirometry. Now, spirometry is all that stuff that you learned about in your physiology class uh, and anatomy and uh, promptly forgot. There's a couple of important things to remember here, though. First of all, the total lung capacity is something that you'll never, ever be able to achieve, right? So the total lung capacity, 
includes the, and when I say you will never achieve it, what I mean is that you'll never be able to exhale this amount. And the reason is that the total lung capacity is made up of the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume, plus the expiratory reserve volume, plus the residual volume. Well, what are all those things? Well, the residual volume is the amount of um, air that's in the lungs that you can't get rid of. You, it, It's because of the way the lung works, when you exhale the maximum amount, there's still air in the airways. And in fact, it's around 1,200 milliliters in the average person. So there's a huge amount of air that you're never, ever going to uh, be able to get rid of in a breath. Now, there's also the expiratory reserve volume. So if you imagine yourself blowing out all of your air and then uh, you have essentially lung, uh, you know, empty lungs, but then force out any more, there's another 1,200 cc's of air in there, right? So you blow out all your air comfortably. And then think about blowing out the rest of the air. That's the expiratory reserve volume. Now, as I'm talking, I'm taking breaths and I'm moving about 500 cc's of air with every breath. And that's the tidal volume. And then add that to the inspiratory reserve volume, where if I take a really deep breath, I can get another 3,100 cc's of air. So these are the, um, the functional things that we worry about uh, or that we're concerned with when we're talking about the lungs. One of the very important measures that we do clinically is the vital capacity. So this is an important indicator of lung function, whether it's a, a eight-year-old girl who comes into the emergency room with an asthma attack, we want to measure her vital capacity, or whether it's a 65-year-old patient with uh, COPD, um, vital capacity measurement is important, and we can do that with spirometry. The next thing to refresh your memory about is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And I, I, the thing that's important here is to know that, as you know, oxygen attaches to the hemoglobin molecule, and depending on different loads or depending on different um, uh, conditions in the body, the oxygen falls off of the hemoglobin molecule at different rates. So if there's a shift to the left, then oxygen falls off toward the blue dotted line. And so the oxygen... Um, the amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues differs depending on this uh, curve. So with a shift to the left, we see, um, uh, we see in alkalosis, for instance, when the pH is higher, we see the PaCO2 being lower. When the temperature is lower, that also decreases the uh, ability of the uh, I'm sorry, increases the ability of the hemoglobin molecule to hold on to oxygen. So that's not really what we want, right? We want the oxygen to be delivered to the tissue, not held on to by the hemoglobin molecule. So a uh, shift to the right is usually preferred. And we see that in acidosis. As the pH is lower, and as the PaCO2 is higher and the temperature is higher, the oxygen falls off of the hemoglobin molecule more readily. That's what we're looking for. Um, now, do we want to make somebody um, uh, acidotic in order to achieve that? No, but from a theoretical perspective anyway, we'd rather have acidosis than alkalosis. So let's talk about a couple of conditions that are... Um, common and that you probably know a lot about already. First of all is asthma. Remember that asthma is really an allergic um, response. The When we talk about allergies, we're talking about mast cells. And those mast cells, when they degranulate, they release histamine. So histamine really mediates this process of uh, allergic asthma. Now, there's also this thing called intrinsic asthma, which is... Uh, has been referred to 
uh, as adult onset asthma, although it can happen in anyone, uh, when adults develop asthma, it tends to be intrinsic, um, can be exercise induced, but also occupational, uh, drug induced from aspirin and NSAIDs. That's an important thing to keep in mind for, uh, uh, for your future career. Remember that aspirin and NSAIDs can have uh, an influence on uh, asthma conditions. And then also food additives like uh, MSG, popular in Asian uh, cooking, um, and in some preservatives are also um, components of intrinsic asthma. But notice here the things that are happening in this picture. So we have degranulation of the mast cells. We have mucus accumulation here. We have mucus plugging that can occur and also smooth muscle constriction, which traps air in the alveoli and uh, causes hyperinflation. This picture is going to look very similar to one that's coming up as well. The difference between this picture and the chronic bronchitis one that we're going to look at is the mast cell degranulation. All right. So remember, that's really the difference between asthma and emphysema from a pathophysiologic standpoint. So what drugs do we use to treat asthma? Well, we use... Uh, medicines that are going to decrease the allergic response. So mast cell stabilizers, uh, corticosteroids would be great. Now, are corticosteroids cuddly drugs? Mm, a little, but not really, right? So how can we limit a corticosteroids negative uh, response or, or how do we, how do we limit the bad stuff about the corticosteroids? Well, we give it locally to the tissue that needs it. And the way we do that is by the inhalation method, right? So patients with asthma have an inhaler that has the corticosteroid in it. We deliver that directly to the tissue that needs it, which is in the lung. And we bypass all the rest of the body parts that don't like it. So, uh, so in this sense, we can make corticosteroids cuddly drugs because we're just delivering it to the tissue that needs it. Now, remember when we do that, if some of the corticosteroid ends up on the tongue, for instance, uh, with this inhaler, then that can affect the patient um, by putting them at risk for candida infections or other uh, uh, oral fungal infections. What else do we use? Well, we use um, leukotriene receptor antagonists. Uh, those are also inhaled. And then we also like long-acting beta-2 agonists. So remember, when we activate the beta-2 receptors, what are we doing? We're causing bronchodilation, right? So we love the idea of long-acting beta-2 agonists because they keep the uh, lung tissue open for airflow uh, for a long period of time. Now, sometimes when patients come into the hospital uh, in the emergency room, for instance, or when patients have an exacerbation or a flare at home, we need to give them uh, something more quickly. And therefore, that's when we use the, the rescue inhalers. That's the short-acting inhaled beta-2 agonists. But sometimes in a pinch, we need to give them some IV corticosteroids as well. And that's an easy thing to do in the emergency room. Um, we just give them a, a, a shot of uh, cortisol and their um, acute inflammatory process is relieved. So then we can talk about COPD. And as I said, it's similar, but it's different. So asthma is really a reactive airway disease. It reacts to the environmental um, components. So the allergens in the air, for instance, uh, cause the asthma to worsen. With COPD, there's really a functional unit uh, of the lung that's affected. And um, what, what happens is that we see this uh, picture like we look at here on the right, where there's mucus plugging that occurs. And as that mucus plugging occurs during inspiration, as these uh, walls are open, then during expiration, the walls tend to close and that traps air in here so that patients don't have a lot of air movement. And that's a problem, obviously. This is called air trapping, and we see that in COPD quite a bit. Now, 
chronic bronchitis is one of the two chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. We talk about chronic bronchitis and we talk about um, uh, emphysema. The two are very different pathophysiologically. The, uh, the, the interesting thing is that they almost never appear um, independently. Uh, patients who have chronic bronchitis from smoking also have emphysema, right? So the pure blue bloater and pink puffer that we uh, learned about really don't exist very often. There's usually a component of both. Now, chronic bronchitis, as I said, looks very similar to asthma, doesn't it? Except remember up here where we looked at the mast cell degranulation? There ain't none of that. There is no mast cell degranulation. Rather, there is inflammation uh, of the epithelial layer producing more mucus, mucus plugging occurs, and hyperinflation uh, of the alveoli. The blue bloater is the, um, uh, the chronic bronchitis kind of patient, but as I said, that rarely occurs in um, uh, independent of the emphysema. So in emphysema, the alveoli are broken. That's it. They don't work. They move air, but air gets trapped in there. And the whole alveolar unit is broken and it can't produce any um, gas exchange. And that's the end of the story. It's not a good story. Doesn't have a happy ending. But that is the uh, functional problem with emphysema. It's breakdown of the alveoli and therefore poor gas exchange or no gas exchange, actually. That's um, typically the pink puffer uh, kind of look. And again, we don't see that independent of the, CO, of the bron chronic bronchitis. Beta-2 agonists like albuterol or provental uh, and the long-term, uh, the longer-acting one, Saravent or Salmeterol, um are the two beta-2 agonists that we commonly see used. Um, it's important that we avoid these um, being used with MAO inhibitors, although hardly anybody's on MAO inhibitors anymore. It's an antidepressant class that um, is uh, very effective in treating depression, but if you eat a pickle, you die, right? So that for that reason, because of the weird... Um, uh, dietary restrictions with MEO inhibitors, we uh, don't use them very often at all anymore. Anticholinergics are another uh, medicine that we use a lot for COPD. Uh, remember, Atrovent uh, is Iprotropium, and it is an anticholinergic. And anticholinergics have these four side effects that we have to worry about. It dries everything out. That's what that's what uh, anticholinergics do. They dry everything out. So you can't pee, you can't see, you can't spit, and you can't, uh, well, you know what rhymes with that. Okay? Corticosteroids, as I said, we love giving these things uh, uh, in an inhaled method so that only the tissue that needs it gets it, but it does somewhat put patients at risk for oral fungal infections. Uh, and sometimes it's not sufficient. Sometimes we need to give a bigger dose and there we can do an oral prednisone dose, or you can give IV solumedrol or solucortef. So let's talk about this process of respiratory failure. Um, there are many different reasons that respiratory failure can happen. We've talked about some of them with COPD and asthma. You can have respiratory failure. Um, next week, we're going to talk about some infections that can cause respiratory failure. Um, but to begin with, let's talk about how um, the body regulates the pH in the blood. So remember that... Um, that the lungs have an effect here uh, on the pH of the blood. Uh, there are three systems in the blood or in the body that uh, regulate acid base balance. The first is a buffer system where there's just this uh, carbonic acid that circulates all the time. Um, and in the, uh, uh, in the bloodstream that, uh, base gets attached to the acid, turns into a salt. Remember that from chemistry class? Base plus an acid equals salt. 
Um, and so that's the buffer that circulates in your blood all the time. It works instantly. The problem is that there's not much of it. And so it can't take on a real big, um, impact. It can deal with smaller amounts, um, that happen in, immediately, or, uh, it needs to get help. And the second place it gets help is from the lungs. So this carbonic acid is about twice as powerful as the buffer system. Uh, and it works in minutes to hours. So it takes a little longer. And then if it needs more help, the most potent, um, effect on pH comes from the kidneys and that's the production of bicarbonate, uh, that is again, the most powerful system, but it takes hours or days to really start working. So this is a, um, this, these patterns that we see, uh, can be reflected in the blood tests. Now notice that we have a very narrow range of what's normal here. So from seven, three, five to seven, four, five is kind of what we learn, but the body really likes it a little tighter, 7.38 to 7.42. But really when we're evaluating this, I want you to memorize the number 7.40. That is the ideal um, uh, pH for the blood 7.40. Yes, it can occur in a range, but as we're considering whether somebody's acidotic or alkalotic, we're going to use 7.40 as the, uh, uh, as the tipping point. Okay. Notice that once we get past 7.8 or 6.8, um, the body can't tolerate that. And that's where death occurs. So we have a very narrow range that we have to focus on here. Um, and that your body has to focus on as well. So how do you know if somebody has respiratory or metabolic acidosis or alkalosis? Well, I want to introduce you to the marching metabolics, right? Um, it's not the blue band, but I thought that might be a, uh, um, relevant reference. Um, the marching metabolics are, uh, a way for you to know that somebody has a, uh, metabolic problem. So notice that when we see a metabolic process going on, the pH goes down and so does the bicarb. The bicarb goes down in order to, um, uh, minimize or to, um, it's the word I want to treat that acidosis that's occurring. So the drop in the bicarb goes along with the drop in the pH. And that tells us that there's a metabolic process going on, or they both rise together, which tells us uh, again, that it's a metabolic process, but it's alkalo alkalosis instead of acidosis. And then when we see the, uh, PCO2, responding in the opposite direction of the pH, then we know that that's a respiratory process. Okay. So we'll practice this some more. Um, but I just want you to understand that, uh, process and that will help you to be able to rapidly identify whether a problem is primarily, uh, acid, I'm sorry, primarily metabolic or respiratory. So what is respiratory failure? Well, the definition is that it's a sudden and life-threatening deterioration in pulmonary gas exchange resulting in carbon dioxide retention and inadequate oxygenation. Lovely. What does that mean? Well, there's two types of respiratory failure. There's hypoxemic respiratory failure where it's just the low oxygen that, uh, that is the problem. All right. When there's hypercapnic respiratory failure, that means that the PaCO2 is elevated. That's the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood, in the arterial blood. That's what the little a is. And so if there's um, uh, an elevated PaCO2, then, uh, then you could consider that hypercapnic, but it's only hypercapnic respiratory failure if there's also acidosis. So the pH also has to be affected uh, for this to be hypercapnic respiratory failure. So again, to review, hypoxemic respiratory failure, we only look at the oxygen. Hypercapnic respiratory failure, we have to look at the CO2 
and the pH. They have to be acidotic in addition to uh, being hypercapnic. So there uh, are always new threats to uh, the human body coming about. And the most recent thing, even though it was many years ago now, um, in 10 or 12 years ago, I believe. Actually, I think, it, I think this first happened in 2003 with the SARS virus. Um, so 15, 16 years ago. Um, but there are always new organisms coming out and potentially threatening us. This is a particularly lethal, um, group of organisms called coronaviruses, uh, that, started in uh, China in 2003. And then we also uh, isolated some of these viruses in the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome or MERS uh, five or six years later. So there are always new emerging threats. And uh, the CDC, which is part of the U.S. Public Health Service, uh, is an important ambassador in the world in trying to manage these outbreaks. Um, and it's an exciting uh, place to work. If you're interested in that kind of thing, look up the uh, U.S. Public Health Service. Uh, there's all sorts of career opportunities there. All right, so let's talk about ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, which has now been rephrased Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. Uh, but essentially, it's just bad lungs. So here's the way that um, uh, acute lung failure works. So ARDS is part of uh, a whole range of problems that can affect the lungs. And it's a specific type of acute lung injury or ALI. Uh, about 18% of acute lung failures are ARDS. 23% um, are slightly less severe, and those are called acute lung injury um, and then acute lung failures in this particular group that was studied, uh, was the, um, uh, was the larger portion. So acute lung failure can happen because of infection can happen because of, um, uh, shunt units. It can happen because of, uh, pulmonary embolism, etc. So know that those are some of the potential issues. The other um, kind that we're talking about specifically right now, though, is acute lung injury and very specifically ARDS. So what is ARDS? Well, it's an acute, diffuse, inflammatory lung injury that leads to worse pulmonary vascular permeability and loss of aerated tissue. Very nice. So again, we have this complex definition. I don't know what that means, but uh, take a look at this chest x-ray. What's it look like? You see these patchy white infiltrates everywhere. You're supposed to see black here where the lungs are, right? So here's the hard outline. Very nice. But we're supposed to see black here. And what we see is these patchy white infiltrates. And that is kind of uh, pathognomonic of ARDS. When it's combined with more difficulty uh, ventilating patients and oxygenating them. So let's talk about those specific issues. So ventilation difficulty means that when we try to inflate the lung, we meet a lot of resistance. And that's because the lungs are no longer compliant. Compliant means they do what they're told, right? If you're compliant, you um, hand in your compliances on time. Remember that? Sorry. Um, so when we're having trouble ventilating the patient, we meet a lot of resistance. That's because of poor compliance. That's one aspect of ARDS. The other aspect is that because of all the infiltrates here, we have trouble oxygenating. So we, we can't get the um, air exchange or the gas exchange to really happen very well. And that leads to poor oxygenation as well. So remember that there is this inflammatory response, and I show you this slide every, talk, every time we talk about inflammation, because I think it's important that you know that inflammation is the source of a lot of problems that we have. It's also the way the body heals, but when it's kicked into overdrive, it can cause problems. So some of the problems that we see in the acute inflammatory response 
are um, mast cell degranulation, which causes some uh, permeability of the vessels here so that fluid can leak out. That's the transudate, right? So the fluid can leak out into the interstitial space here. And also these uh, neutrophils immigrate out of the vessel wall and become macrophages. And sometimes there's a little bleeding that happens as well as these red cells spill over because these holes between the cells cells get so big, not only does fluid go through, but also red cells can leak out as well. Then there's also all this neurochemical kind of stuff that happens with um, um, uh, chemotactic factors and things like that. Uh, the um, stimulation of platelet adhesion and all of this other stuff that happens because of the leukocyte activity. Uh, and then last of all, there's also this fibrin deposition that happens. And sometimes we get a complication uh, where uh, blood clotting forms here and, uh, and goes haywire. So this is the acute inflammatory response. Uh, it's a good idea for you to sort of commit this to memory and understand what's going on at the capillary level. Now let's talk about what happens in ARDS. It's a complicated syndrome. There's a lot of components to it. Um, there are these six things, that, these six phases that we're going to briefly talk about. But what I want you to know is that after the uh, inflammatory response begins, it ends with fluid in the interstitial space and in the alveolus. And so there's no way for gas exchange to happen because of all this fluid. All right. So in phase one and two, there's this injury that results to the um, uh, to the alveolar unit and platelets aggregate and histamine gets released. And that changes the uh, the cell mem or the um, uh, the semi permeable membrane uh, that exists between the blood uh, capillary and the alveolus. Next. Uh, as that capillary permeability increases, uh, particles flow out and also edema develops. And that edema goes right into the uh, alveolus and it leaks into the interstitial space here as well. And then finally, that limits the ability of CO2 to come into the uh, alveolus to cause gas exchange uh, with the air portion. And as uh, pulmonary edema worsens, then fibrosis occurs because the body is trying to heal itself, but it heals itself with this inflexible scar tissue and scar tissue can't exchange gas. And so this is a downward spiral that uh, ends poorly. That is essentially ARDS. So, if you don't understand all six of those steps, no big whoop. What I want you to understand is the basics, all right? And this is another way to understand it. Essentially, the um, alveolus or the alveolar unit, which consists of the alveolus and the pulmonary capillary here, uh, become affected. And the inflammatory response causes fluid to leak out here into the interstitial space and also to fill up the... Um, uh, the alveolus and together that makes it a very, very, uh, difficult thing to exchange gas. And it, uh, increases the, um, uh, resistance to ventilation and decreases the ability of us to, uh, adequately, uh, treat someone's, um, oxygen status. So the clinical course of ARDS is um, a very quick and ugly one. Uh, when patients develop ARDS, they are, A, difficult to ventilate. So uh, we have to do some fancy tricks on the ventilator to facilitate that. And B, they're tough to oxygenate, right? Those are the definitions of ARDS. And so when they're hard to oxygenate, that also means that we have to do some funny tricks. Now, what is it that predicts um, how the patient will do? Well, first of all, patients who are of an advanced age, right? So the elderly have a very difficult 
a clinical course that uh, usually does not end well. It can also be disease related, right? The, uh, as a predictor of death, um, people who can't exchange gas very well, uh, when there's pulmonary vascular dysfunction, dead space, uh, and concomitant infection. Um, the other interesting thing is that ARDS that's due to trauma is usually, uh, or is often, um, easier to get through, not easy, but easier to get through than ARDS due to say infection. Um, and then finally there's treatment related predictors of death. So people who are, um, overly uh, positive on their eyes and O's patients who are treated with, uh, glucocorticoids, those who get transfusions, those who we wait, um, to transfer later. And those who, um, are not managed by an intensivist service, uh, that really understands the process of ARDS. Those are, uh, predictors of death, uh, in this horrible disease. Now, if patients survive, they are also dramatically affected, uh, by the disease process. So cognitive dysfunction from being on the ventilator and being hypoxemic for so long, um, cognitive, cognitive dysfunction occurs in 30 to 49% of patients. Also, um, depression, anxiety, PTSD can be in almost, um, uh, two thirds of patients and physical impairments, um, uh, as a result of being uh, in the ICU for so long, physical impairments like um, uh, musculoskeletal problems and uh, wounds, you know, pressure ulcers, uh, contracture injuries, those kind of things happen in about two thirds of patients as well. So even if you survive the clinical course of uh, ARDS, um, that is only the very beginning of a very, very long road to recovery. Now, we are getting better at treating ARDS, and you can see that since 1983, when this really, uh, when the um, studies really started to happen, you can see that we're getting much, much better. But again, you know that we, uh, we have a long way to go, um, and if patients do survive, uh, there's an awful lot of uh, morbidity that goes along with um, with surviving this. So how do we treat ARDS? Well, uh, oxygenation is first and foremost, right? We need to provide oxygen and gas exchange. Mechanical ventilation is a big part of it. As I said earlier, um, having these fancy um, methods of delivering uh, mechanical ventilation uh, are very important as well. So those are kind of beyond the scope of this course, but uh, there are things that we can do to the ventilator and different ways of delivering air that can, uh, that can influence uh, at least the oxygenation, if not the outcome. Another big thing is VV ECMO. So if we can get the lungs to survive this and the body uh, to survive um, the insult, um, then the patient will go, may go on to, uh, recovery, albeit a slow one. And one way that we can do that is with VV ECMO, right? So veno venous ECMO is where we take the blood out of the body, uh, in the right atrium and, uh, just oxygenate it and get rid of the CO2 and then put it back into the body. The heart's doing its own work. So we don't need to support the cardiac output. We just need to oxygenate the blood. And that's, um, uh, something that we do. Um, I have no idea why I put this in one year, but, um, here's a picture of Dr. Evil. I, I'm sorry. I don't remember why I put that in. So now let's talk about oxygen therapy. So we're done talking about ARDS, but uh, it may have uh, brought to mind some questions about how do we deliver oxygen? So I know we can do it through the ventilator, but how else can we do it? Well, uh, we have nasal cannula, right? So you know that you can deliver one to six liters, uh, actually less than one. You could do a half a liter per minute. Um via nasal cannula. Now what you see on this patient is actually high flow nasal cannula where you can deliver an FiO2. That's a fraction of inspired oxygen. That is the percent of O2 that you're breathing, by the way. Uh, so we can 
we can give an FiO2 up to 100% uh, with this high flow nasal cannula. And um, th this is kind of a, a newer development, you know, by newer, I mean the last 10, 15 years. Um, uh, the, so it, it's kind of cool because we don't need these fancy face masks all the time. Uh, a face tent is really just a comfort thing. It allows patients to breathe humidified oxygen, but uh, we don't really deliver much more oxygen uh, or a, much of a higher FiO2 than what you do uh, with room air. It, it is very nice for um, making patients breathe easier because you're giving them humidified, cooled oxygen. Face masks then can be used for delivering uh, 5 to 10 liters per minute or an FiO2. That is a fraction of inspired oxygen. Remember, that's the percent O2 that you're breathing uh, between 40 and 60 percent. And just to remind you, you know that all of us are breathing 21 percent FiO2, right? So that's room air is 21 percent, at least at our elevation. Venturi masks are these kind of cool things that use the Venturi effect of uh, airflow uh, dynamics to deliver different amounts of oxygen. So you get the mask and a whole bunch of these little colored um, attachments and you hook the colored attachment to the mask and then you hook the uh, the oxygen tubing to this part. And based on the um, design of this and the... Um, the, the way that the oxygen is uh, sent through this, we deliver different uh, inspired oxygen concentrations. So with this particular manufacturer, the blue one, uh, the blue tip delivers essentially three liters per minute. Right, or, I mean, I'm sorry, one liter per minute, uh, which is 24% uh, oxygen. And then um, the higher percents with the, the different attachments up to a 60% uh, FiO2. And of course you have to set the, um, oxygen flow rate, uh, accordingly. So in order to deliver 24% with the blue tip, we would set the oxygen flow to two to four liters. And, uh, in little tiny lettering on the plastic piece here, it tells you what percent FiO2 you're going to deliver and what you need to set the oxygen on the wall to, uh, in order to deliver that. Then we have the partial rebreather and the non rebreather masks. The difference between a partial rebreather and a non rebreather is the presence of these valves here and here. So a non rebreather mask has valves here and here. That means when you take a deep breath in, it's only pulling air from this reservoir bag, which is 100% uh, oxygen, because this is a one-way valve that's open toward inhalation. When the patient exhales, it closes this valve and opens this one so that you're breathing out everything uh, from the mask and not contaminating, so to speak, this reservoir bag. Okay. A trach collar is also important to remember that um, we put this on so that uh, we're delivering humidified oxygen or humidified air, at least, uh, to patients who are not breathing through their mouth and uh, pharynx, which typically warms and humidifies the air that we breathe. Instead, it goes directly into the uh, trachea here and uh, needs to be humidified first. This thing always makes me crazy when I see it, this T-piece method for delivering oxygen. Imagine you have um, an endotracheal tube in, goes into your lungs, you can't breathe anywhere except through this tube, and then you have that resistance of the tubing that you have to pull through, and we take you off the ventilator where the ventilator's doing all the work for you, and before we decide to extubate you, we give you a trial of breathing through this tiny straw uh, and see if you tolerate it. Well, most patients don't tolerate this very well because of this uh, amount of resistance of breathing through this tube. To simulate this, take you know two or three straws um, from the cafeteria. Well, actually, they don't have straws in the cafeteria anymore. But imagine um, going to McDonald's and getting two straws there and putting them in your mouth and just breathe through those two straws for a minute or two. You get tired of doing it. 
right? It doesn't last very long before you get tired. Well, what we used to do in the old days was take the patient off the ventilator, the thing that was going to breathe for them if they couldn't breathe on their own, and we would put them on this T piece and hope that they did well, right? And hopefully we're monitoring them to know uh, if they're going to breathe okay. Well, we don't do this anymore. This is ridiculous. It was a, uh, a horrible idea when we did it, and it's even a worse idea now because there's no safety mechanism built in here. So don't do it. No T pieces anymore. It's 2000. Uh, it's at least 2019 and, um, we don't do that anymore. So nursing care assessment and management. Um, I put some slides together here for you to think about, uh, how you're going to organize and deliver your nursing care. Um, so I'll let you think about those things. Um, Airways. There are many different airways out there. Uh, artificial airways include endotracheal tubes and nasopharyngeal airways, etc. Um, the oral and nasal airways are something that you can deliver as a nurse and you can save a life with these. The nasal trumpets, these plastic ones up here, are very flexible. You put a little bit of lube on them and you stick them right into the nose. Patients do not enjoy that, but uh, you could save their life with it just by giving them uh, an oral, or uh, I'm sorry, a nasal airway uh, that allows air to get into their pharynx uh, from the nose. The patient can be wide awake when you do that. Um, they may come at you swinging when you do it, but. Uh, but you can put these into somebody who's wide awake. The oral airways are not meant for patients who are awake because it gags them and it's no good. But patients who are uh, obtunded, you can save a life with this because it pushes the tongue out of the way. Remember that when you put this in, it goes in upside down or on its side and then curves the other way so that it, it you know, it's curved like this over top of the tongue. Um, these do not protect you from aspiration, so they're not good for long-term management, but they're good in a pinch until you can get uh, one of these in. This is an endotracheal tube. Uh, these have to be put in by the most experienced person in the room, uh, usually anesthesia. Um, they, we use different devices to, uh, to get them into the right place, and um, positioning has to be verified. Uh, it's not 100% accurate um, to just listen to the lungs, for instance. We have to verify it with some other device, like a, a expired CO2 uh, device, and we can play with some of those things in the sim lab uh, this semester. When we go to intubate somebody with one of these endotracheal tubes, it's helpful to know how challenging it's going to be. If I can see all the landmarks like this, then it's going to be a pretty easy intubation considering. But if I look back and I, all I see is hard palate, I can't even see the uvula, um, then when I look with the scope, it's going to look like this. That is not an easy intubation by any means. Um, this is what we hope to see when we go in through the, uh, mouth with, the um, uh, with the, the laryngoscope, sorry, it escaped me there for a minute. Uh, this is what we hope to see, but if you have a, uh, class four palette, then you might end up looking at this and that's not a good sight. So for those patients who are very difficult, um, intubations and particularly patients who are in the field, we need something that, um, anybody can put in or, or more of anybody than, uh, can do an endotracheal tube. And so, we use these devices like laryngeal masks. This actually just goes right over top of the larynx and you can deliver the oxygen through here um, with a bag valve mask. Um, it, it just so happens that instead of the mask being over top of the face, it's right over top of the larynx. So you just push this in and it's good to go. The other thing that we have is this EOA or an esophageal obturator airway. This is cool because this actually goes into the esophagus and then you inflate this balloon down here, which keeps the stomach contents in the stomach. And then when you inflate, uh, when you attach the, the bag to this, uh, device here, 
what you get is air going just into the trachea, right? It goes into the pharynx and, and down into the trachea because this obturator uh, occludes the esophagus. So these are uh, used by less skilled clinicians, particularly in the field, to get an airway quickly. Now, I want to remind you that when you have a patient who had a laryngectomy, there is no communication from the mouth or the nose down to the um, uh, trachea. When you have a patient with a stoma um, after a laryngectomy, the stoma goes directly to the lungs. It does not communicate at all with the pharynx. So if you put a bag valve mask on this patient up here and do try to deliver air through here, it goes nowhere. It goes into the mouth and into the throat, but it doesn't go anywhere except into the stomach, right? The only way to deliver oxygen to a patient who has a stoma is to go directly into the stoma. All right. The other thing we can do is this emergency cricothyrotomy uh, where you can uh, insert a, an emergency airway uh, through the cricoid cartilage. Um, you have to be trained to do that, of course, but, uh, but that's, that's what's done. And then a longer term solution is a tracheostomy where we can actually put the trach directly into the, um, uh, directly into the trachea. So let's talk now about suctioning. Um, it's an art that uh, you have to learn as a critical care nurse and, uh, well, any nurse who's taking care of patients with airway issues. Um, the standard method here that we use is to hyperoxygenate a bit before uh, suctioning if they're on the ventilator. Um, we do use a sterile technique. There's been back and forth about whether we do a clean or sterile technique. You never get hurt by using the sterile technique, right? And then um, there are still nurses who you will find who do the saline installation. You know, they take one of those little fish, their little orange uh, or clear plastic um, uh, thingies that are filled with saline and they put that down the tube. And the idea is that it uh, breaks up the secretions and uh, you suction out more uh, mucus. The problem is that when you measure the amount that you get back, it's not even the same amount that you put in. So it's probably not doing anything. Um, we've done study after study after study of this. It does not work. Don't do it. So we've known this for 25 years. People still put saline down to make them feel better. Um, meanwhile, you're torturing the patient by having them cough and gag and carrying on. So don't even try it on me. All right. Now, mechanical ventilation. Let's talk about that. Um, there's not much that you need to know. Mechanical ven ventilation is a very complicated topic, but I'm going to make it super easy for you because there's really only three or four things that you need to know. Um, first of all, why do we do it? Well, we do it for people who can't breathe on their own. We do it when people are unable to maintain a patent airway. Um, maybe they uh, have had facial trauma and were concerned about their airway patency. Maybe they uh, have overdosed and we are concerned about their ability to generate their own breathing. Uh, there's any number of reasons that we're concerned about somebody's airway and need to uh, breathe for them. There may be patients who have inadequate gas exchange, such as those who have ARDS or other respiratory failure. Um, now, again, there are two kinds of respiratory failure, hypoxemic and hypoxemic hypercapnic uh, respiratory failure. We talked about those already. Now, you may have seen um, pictures like this. This is a child during the polio ep epidemic in the uh, 20th century, and this patient was in a... Um, a ventilator of sorts. Now, these ventilators are positive, uh, I'm sorry, negative pressure ventilators. And the way they work is by um, having bellows at the foot of this thing. And the bellows would um, push air into this iron lung. And that would cause the patient's chest to collapse blowing out all of their oxygen or all of their air. And then as the bellows expanded, um, then that would make a suction in the 
uh, iron lung that would pull air in through the patient's nose and mouth. And so the patient laid in this for hours at a time, and uh, they were able to uh, breathe when their um, when their respiratory muscles were uh, paralyzed from uh, polio. Uh, but you know, this wasn't a one-off thing. There wasn't one kid who needed this service. There were many children who needed uh, the use of the iron lung. And in fact, uh, during the heyday of the polio epidemic, there were thousands and thousands of children around the country who needed uh, negative pressure in, um, uh, ventilation. Well, today we still have this. I didn't even know this. This is the craziest thing. I didn't know we still had negative pressure ventilators until I found this picture online. I was like shocked. Um, so apparently there are still people who use negative pressure um, ventilators. And I guess this would be useful for people who did not want to have an airway, right? They were able to maintain their own airway. They just didn't have enough uh, or they don't have enough um, capability to, um, to be able to use their respiratory muscles. Uh, I was thinking maybe ALS patients, this would be a good, um, use, um, you know, in the early stages, but most of the ventilation that's done in the world now, or at least in this country, um, has been supplanted by the positive pressure ventilator. So there are a couple of things that you need to think about with positive pressure ventilators. First of all, there's either volume cycled or pressure cycled. Now, at the most basic, a volume cycled ventilator uses a specific amount of uh, air you know, a specific volume of air and delivers that volume to the patient, no matter what the pressure is. So imagine that you have a very low volume, uh, that you need to instill, say a hundred cc's. Um, we're going to instill that hundred cc's of air into the lungs, but it's not going to be hard to do, right? Cause it's only a hundred cc's and we're not going to cause uh, much of an increase in the pressure. But let's say that we try to put two liters of air into the lungs or six liters of air into the lungs. At some point, we're going to have a huge increase in the pressure because the lungs are filled up. We can't put any more in. And so if we still continue to try to deliver that huge volume of air, the pressures are going to go too high. So we always have to remember that when we're doing volume cycled ventilation, we're limited by the pressure that is generated. When we do pressure cycled ventilation, we instill any amount of air until we get to a certain pressure point, at which point it stops. So if you think about very compliant lungs, we can give a very large volume of uh, air before the pressure increases so high that we can't do it anymore. But think about the patient who has ARDS and they have a uh, real limit in the compliance of their lungs, right? Remember, it's very hard to ventilate these patients because as soon as we start to push air in, the pressure goes so high because the lungs are very non-compliant. They don't expand very well. So in that patient population, we wouldn't get very much air into them at all before the pressure prevents us from uh, doing so. So those are the two common um, ventilator um, cycled methods that we use, either volume cycled or pressure cycled. There's also this thing called the high frequency ventilator, and we use this in acute lung injury, uh, such as ARDS. Um, but there, there's not much to understand about that for our purposes today. This is the slide that I really want you to focus on. Um, essentially, there are three modes of ventilation that we're going to talk about. Assist control, IMV, and CPAP. Now, you can think of it as going in a continuum where it starts out with the ventilator doing all the work in assist control. The ventilator does all the work. Every breath that you take is delivered by the ventilator. Okay. Then IMV 
intermittent mandatory ventilation or synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation uh, is where the ventilator does some of the work and the patient does some of the work. And then in CPAP, the ventilator doesn't do anything. All the, uh, all the work is done by the patient. Now, getting a little bit more granular, let's look at what assist control is. So here we can see that um, whenever the ventilator cycles, it's going to deliver a certain pressure or volume of uh, air. And in this case, we can see that the volume is delivered um, by it, uh, by the machine itself. Now here we can see that there's a negative inspiratory force. This is where the patient initiates the breath, but notice this, even though the patient initiates this breath, it delivers the same pressure and same volume, regardless of whether the machine does it on its own or whether it's initiated by the patient. Okay, so assist control is where the patient, uh, I'm sorry, the ventilator does all the work. It um, delivers a certain number of breaths, say 10 breaths a minute at a certain volume of uh, or pressure of air. And that's what happens. If the patient does anything, then the patient initiates the breath and the ventilator delivers that full breath of air, whether it's by pressure or volume, doesn't matter. All right. So that's assist control. Now contrast that with IMV where the patient gets a mandatory ventilation intermittently. All right. So this is the ventilator doing the work and it um, delivers a certain pressure or volume of air. And then when the patient initiates a breath, they only get the volume or pressure of air that, um, I'm sorry, and it's not actually pressure. They, they get only the volume of air that they draw. All right. So the patient starts a breath and they just take a small breath here because that's all they can do. They don't get the full volume of air that's delivered with assist control. They just get whatever they decide to pull. All right. And that's as opposed to the IMV or I'm sorry, to the assist control setting where every patient breath gets delivered a full volume that is set ahead of time with IMV. They initiate the breath and then they only get what they can draw. And then intermittently, you know, 10 times every minute, the ventilator delivers a full breath, regardless of whether the patient breathes or not. OK, so that's the difference. Uh, between IMV and assist control. And then when the patient's all better and we're ready to extubate them, then we put them on a trial of CPAP. CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. This is what people wear at night. Maybe some of your parents wear these at night when they go to sleep. Um, they have this mask that they wear that maintains a certain pressure in the airways uh, at all times. Now, Notice that the, uh, the ventilator in CPAP mode does not deliver any air. The only air that's drawn is what the patient initiates. So a patient initiated breath is what starts this. And then they pull out just like IMV, they pull out the amount that they want, not the amount that the ventilator is set to deliver because it's not set to deliver anything. It's all up to the patient in CPAP mode. Okay. So when do we use these? Well, we use the assist control when the patient comes out of the operating room, for instance. Um, they're already anesthetized or sleepy. They're not going to do any work on their own anyway. So we just set it at assist control. We know that they're going to get the minimum amount of air, and that's fine. As the patient starts to wake up, we don't want them to take a breath, you know, 15 times a minute and get that full volume of air because they're going to blow off too much CO2. So then we would switch them to IMV where whenever they take a breath, they only draw in the amount of extra air that they want. And then once the patient's awake and alert and doing all that, then we set it to CPAP where they have to draw all the air on their own. All right. Now, there are some other things that we can do, and I'm going to talk about those in a second, but um, get used to seeing how ventilator settings are adjusted or, or written. So SIMV is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. 10 is the number of breaths that it's going to deliver intermittently. 
400 cc's is the number of um uh, is the volume of air that's delivered and uh 40% is the FiO2 and then we have this thing called peep which is the positive end expiratory pressure. You can think of that as the pressure that holds the alveoli open at the end of a breath. And that's kind of analogous to um, the pressure that you have in your chest just because there's air present. So as you're exhaling, remember you can't get rid of that 1200 cc's in your chest because it's taking up space in the alveoli and the uh, bronchioles. Um, That air uh, when you and I are breathing on our own, holds the alveoli open. On a ventilator, we use the setting of PEEP, peak and uh, uh, peak end expiratory pressure, to uh, maintain the alveolar function. And then finally is this thing called pressure support, and there's 10 centimeters of pressure support here. So let's talk about what pressure support is, along with some of these other little ventilator tricks. Pressure support is essentially a way of overcoming the resistance of the tubing. So put on your thinking cap and listen to this. When uh, you are hooked up to the ventilator, there's air that fills those ventilator tubes all the way back to the machine. In order to move that column of air, you would have to generate enough suction to make that air move, right? Well, when you turn on pressure support, it moves the column of air for you. The ventilator, when you start the negative inspiratory force, it knows that it's just going to um, draw that so that you don't have to have a negative suction uh, or a negative inspiratory force. It's just going to move that column of air for you um, in order to support your breathing. So that's called pressure support. It's a little hard concept to understand. Just memorize it for now, okay? It overcomes the resistance of the tubing. Size matter. I know it's a little play on words, but um, size, if you think about it, I know when you're sitting in lecture hall and listening to me drone on and on and on, a lot of you are sighing as well, right? When's this going to be over? Big deep breath. Well, that sigh that you do um, actually is something that we can program into the ventilator because physiologically our bodies are accustomed to a sigh, uh, you know, once or twice a minute or every couple of minutes. Okay. So we can program that into the ventilator. And then we talked briefly about this positive end expiratory pressure. This is the pressure that keeps the alveoli open. Um, About five centimeters is physiologic. You know, that's about the same amount of peep that we have when we're breathing on our own. Um, And we can use this to improve oxygenation. We can increase the peep. The problem is that once we get up to, you know, much above 15 or so, certainly by 20 centimeters, um, we end up causing pressure related trauma potentially, uh, to the alveoli. So it's a neat trick that we can use when we have somebody in ARDS in the early stages, because it helps us to deliver more oxygen and get better results. But, uh, at the cost of barotrauma to the airways. So what are the problems with positive pressure ventilation? Well, compliance issues are huge, right? So first of all, the patient being willing to be on the machine. Um, some people buck the ventilator, right? Where they, uh, they have the ventilator hooked up and they just don't cooperate with it. They resist letting the machine do the breathing for them. And uh, th- so that's one kind of resistance. But the other kind of resistance that we were talking about uh, is really compliance. And that is the ability of the tissue to expand and contract. So normal, healthy lung tissue tissue, very compliant. It's easy to uh, put air in. It blows up like a balloon and uh, the air comes back out during expiration. But in somebody who has a lung injury or chronic lung disease, uh, their compliance is affected. Other potential uh, complications involve uh, aspiration, right? So we could have uh, a patient who has a lot of water in the tubing and you'll see the uh, water collect in the tubing. And if you're not careful with it, you can end up dumping that water into the uh, patient's lungs. That's a mess, right? We don't want to do that. 
barotrauma, pneumothorax, uh, as is shown right here. So you can see the lung markings over here. See all these white lines, these white squiggly lines, not these big things. These are ribs, but the little white lines like this one, this one here, these are all lung markings that you can see going out all the way to the edge over here. You don't see lung markings. And that is because this is the lung right here. See this lung right here. That is the lung and it's collapsed because this is all air filling the pleural space, not filling the lung. And that definitely happens. There's ventilator associated pneumonia, which is one of those quality indicators that we, uh, that we're concerned with. Uh, when you have positive pressure ventilation, particularly with a lot of peep, uh, we have a decrease in the cardiac output. We have water imbalance problems because we're not blowing off as much water as we're accustomed to because of this closed system. There's like all sorts of potential complications. We hate the ventilator. We want to get it done and get patients off the ventilator as soon as we can. But guess what? We need the ventilator sometimes and we're willing to live with some of these potential complications as well. So, uh, again, I put together some slides to tell you about the nursing management. Um, we've talked in, um, the clinical skills sessions and you in particularly in the MIMQ and MICQ have talked about endotracheal tube care and, um, and trach care and cuff pressure monitoring and all those things. Uh, remember that these patients are pretty immobile when they have a ventilator and they need uh, all of that care to be done. Uh, oral care, eye care, um, taking care of your patient psychologically is important as well. And of course, when the patient um, is sick, they hopefully have family visiting and uh, it's our responsibility to care for the family as well. So how do we wean patients from mechanical ventilation? Well, there's two kinds of weans. There's the short-term ventilator wean uh, for somebody who may have just had cardiac bypass surgery, for instance. And in that case, uh, they get intubated for the surgical procedure and then they do the operation. And for bypass surgery, they come out of the OR or still anesthetized. It's not reversed. And uh, then when the an anesthetic wears off, you know, in 12 or 24 hours, um, then we pull out the endotracheal tube and they breathe on their own and everybody lives happily ever after. Um, that's a pretty easy wean, uh, in many cases, long-term, uh, ventilation means that you have to account for the fact that the patient has not been breathing on their own for a very long time. And so those patients will require longer and longer periods of assisted ventilation. Um, you know, they'll be on IMV overnight, for instance, and during the day they'll be on CPAP. So, uh, until we can prove that the patient uh, is able to do well without being intubated. Um, long-term ventilator weaning in a medical ICU is a very complicated thing. And, uh, and it's often a very slow, uh, process with lots of ups and downs. So, um, so, so those are, you know, at a very high level, the two, uh, ways to wean people from mechanical ventilation. So sometimes a ventilator in acute lung injury is not sufficient. And what do we do then? Well, we're back to our friend ECMO, right? So we talked about VV ECMO very briefly. Again, this is the, uh, taking the blood out from the, uh, vein and putting it back into the right atrium so that it goes to the left ventricle and, uh, is already oxygenated. We do all the oxygenation outside the body or extra corporeal, right? So I have a case study here for you to uh, think about. Uh, in May 1990, at the peak of the AIDS epidemic, a 52-year-old healthy man presented to the ED with severe pneumonia and a one-week history of flu-like symptoms. Now, um, you weren't alive in 1990, but I can tell you that uh, everybody who was alive then knew that a patient like this um, probably had HIV. At least that's what we thought, right? Well, I'm telling you this story because things are often not as they appear. First of all, why is there a hand inside a frog? Well, we'll get to that. So um, here's the data. His blood pressure was 80 over 50. His heart rate was 150. His respiratory rate was 40. And he was febrile. He had a temperature of 39. Uh, he was ill-appearing in respiratory distress. 
And his ABG on 100% FiO2 with a non-rebreather mask, NRBM, uh, was 7.5, 30, 60, and 22. So the pH was 7.5, the PCO2 was 30, the PO2 was 60, and the bicarb was 22. I'll let you figure out what that represents. So what's next? What nursing care is necessary? Uh, How do we monitor this patient's progress? And what are the signs that the nurse should promptly report to the provider? Um, uh, Again, I'll let you think about that. We can talk about that when we uh, meet up again. Now, it turns out that this patient uh, did not have uh, an HIV infection, but instead had respiratory failure and ARDS from uh, another kind of infection. And uh, this infection went rapidly downhill. He developed ARDS, he developed renal failure, heart failure, DIC, and he was dead two days after admission. That person was Jim Henson, and he was the creator of the Muppets. Um, This infection that he had was called uh, pneumococcus, and it is a very commonly encountered uh, community-acquired pneumonia that can be very, very severe. It hits the body like a ton of bricks, and it is a very, uh, very severe infection potentially. And... um, Uh, the whole world was shocked when he died so suddenly from it. Um, But that's the nature of this illness. When you have uh, an acute lung injury from uh, pneumococcus, it can be very, very severe and um, and life-threatening as well. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. I think uh, that brings us to an end of the lecture and uh, I will let you go online and do the learning activities that we have associated with this.